Human Trafficking 101: Outlining the Problem, Module A. Trafficking and Migration. We begin with the community in a less developed country that is people seeking job opportunities. Within this community, some people may remain and do whatever they can to find work, while others may seek opportunities elsewhere. This could be within their own country or within another country that is considered more prosperous. Those who leave are called migrants. What motivates a person to migrate differs from individual to individual. It could be out of need, a desire to improve one's life, or simply a desire for adventure. If the migrant is lucky enough to be associated with people who have no intention of exploiting him or her, the outcome can be very positive. In the best of circumstances, the working conditions are good, compensation is fair, there is no exploitation or abuse, and the migrant is happy with the terms and conditions. Factors such as the migrant's understanding of the migration process, their type of work, and their ability to access help if needed will influence the process. This is one potential outcome at one end of the spectrum. However, if the potential migrant is ill-informed or being influenced by criminals whose intent is to exploit, the outcome can be devastating. This represents the other end of the spectrum. The person can't leave, does not get paid, and loses control of his or her life. In other words, he or she is in a slave-like condition. It is important to note that in addition to these endpoints, there are many people who migrate and fall somewhere in between these two extremes. For example, a person might be exploited, but not enough to be considered trafficked. Not all exploitation is trafficking or slavery. The Criminal Element As a person begins a migratory process, the conditions differ from individual to individual. Sometimes the migrant makes the journey alone, or sometimes with other migrants, including family members. The process can be through formal, legal channels, or through informal channels that might include smuggling. It is important to note that while many trafficking cases happen cross-border, there are also significant trafficking cases that take place within a country known as internal trafficking. There are four criminal categories associated with human trafficking. In some cases, potential migrants are targeted by unscrupulous people from within a community or from along the migration route. These people, who are known as recruiters, influence a migrant's choices. If the recruiter does this with the intent to exploit, then this person is part of the trafficking chain. The recruiter controls the migrant through fraud, deception, and the establishment of some form of debt. Some recruiters can also act as transporters. A transfer's role in the criminal chain is to assist in transporting moving migrants to an exploitative site. The transporter's involvement may begin at any point along the migration path, inside the village, at the border, or within the community where the exploitation takes place. If he or she does this with the extent to exploit, then this person is part of the trafficking chain. Note, the difference between a smuggler and a transporter is that the smuggler simply offers a service to move a person from one place to another. The intent to exploit is not a motivating factor. The crimes transporters commit often include fraud, deception, kidnapping, or illegal border crossing. It is the transporter who often sells the victim to the exploiter. This, in itself, is a crime. The difficulty with both recruiters and transporters is that it is not always possible to know that they are involved in a trafficking event until after the victim has been moved to the exploitative site. Intent is nearly impossible to prove until after the fact. Both recruiters and transporters are considered minor players in the human trafficking chain. Trafficking outcomes often include forced prostitution, forced labor, including domestic workers and the like. There are basically two categories of people who act as criminals with an exploitative outcome. They break in, enforce and maintain a person in a slave-like situation. Exploiters are the managers and owners of exploitative sites. They are the ones that put in place a situation where slavery flourishes. 
there are also the ones that buy trafficking victims. While they might not be the ones that actually abuse victims with their own hands, they manage the process. Enforcers are the ones that break in and maintain trafficking victims. Their crimes often include rape, torture, assault, threats, coercion, force, and death bondage. Despite their brutality, the criminals that carry out these heinous acts are seldom sought after in most trafficking cases. All play a role in the trafficking process. All would be considered traffickers. All are involved in acts that are criminal in nature. All should be included when carrying out criminal investigations. Chapter 3 Addressing the Exploitation It is important to note that most counter trafficking programs focus on the relationship between the victim and the recruiter or transporter. But while recruiters, middlemen, and transporters are part of the problem, they are not nearly as threatening and damaging as those who actually keep the victim in a slave-like situation. The exploitative business should be the main focus of the counter-trafficking sector. This is where most of the human rights violation takes place. It is also where the main abuse, the enslavement, takes place. To effectively address the human trafficking problem, more emphasis must be placed on limiting the most exploitative sites. This will reduce demand and also send a powerful message to those who might choose to traffic or enslave others. Within all business sectors, there is a continuum from fair, non-exploitative businesses to those that seriously exploit. At some point along this continuum, a business crosses over a line into slavery. Those businesses that are the most exploitative can be targeted and eliminated using any number of existing laws in any country. In the absence of addressing exploitation sites, trafficking will continue unabated. What is the main point? It is an enslavement aspect that gives life to the trafficking sector, not merely the movement of the person with the intent to exploit the traffickers' role. Thus, to truly address the trafficking problem, the exploitation site must be better targeted within the response equation. Chapter 4 Understanding the Post-Exploitation Process Most trafficking victims remain for a period of time in a slave-like condition. Depending on the circumstances, this can last for months or years. There are basically six ways in which a person leaves this environment. Some victims simply run away on their own, often at great risk to themselves. Some victims are rescued through police raids. For others, they are returned to their country of origin after years of service, but without much, sometimes they need remuneration. Some victims are thrown out after receiving an injury or becoming diseased. For some, the person is simply let go to make way for a new person once his or her profitability is lowered through attrition, e.g. a sex worker who no longer attracts clients. Finally, some victims do not survive the experience. Once out, where did most victims end up going? The person may have started benefiting in the environment or feels that he or she has no other options. Instead of returning to their country of origin, the person stays in a location where he or she was trafficked to. In this case, the person feels as if he or she benefits more by staying and returning, e.g. more opportunities to improve his or her status. In this case, a person feels as if he or she benefits more from going to a third country that perhaps offers more opportunities. Voluntary. A person leaves and voluntarily decides to return to their country community of origin. Involuntary. State authorities in a country sometimes force a trafficked person to repatriate to their country of origin. A person ends up in a jail or a remand center. For most victims, the recovery process begins at this point. But how does the recovery process work? With self-help, the victim recovers from the experience with no outside help from NGO or government partners. Most people who have been trafficked fall into this category, but we know little about their experiences. 
While some people are able to successfully start a new, productive life, others are still vulnerable and susceptible to being re-trafficked again. In this case, an NGO or a government facility provides support to the trafficked person. Services often include provision of a stable, secure environment, a psychosocial assessment, counseling, food, shelter and medical care, a peer environment, and legal representation and advice. Services can be provided through a number of different facilities including safe haven sites, drop-in centers, short-term stay facilities, or long-term stay facilities. Lessons learned about recovery Not all support provided to a trafficked person is beneficial. For example, not all shelter homes offer a quality of care that would meet international standards. Likewise, some shelters hold victims in place for extended periods instead of mainstreaming them back into society. Programs which detain victims in closed shelters or give no option to return to their country of origin are not only potentially harmful to victims, but can provide a major disincentive to victims coming forward. The main purpose of the recovery process should be to help to return a person back to society in a manner that does not contribute to their future vulnerability. As part of the recovery process, the trafficked person needs to eventually reintegrate into society. Reintegration options fall into three categories. This transition can be done either with or without help. Some victims reintegrate back into their family. While some families take them back, this is not always the case. For example, if the family knows that their daughter was forced to be a sex worker, the shame associated with this outcome might cause them to shun her, even though she may have been victimized. Some victims decide not to go home because they fear the stigma associated with their experience or feelings of shame due to having failed to achieve their goals, i.e. supporting their family with money. Some victims reintegrate back into their previous communities or a new one. Once again, community acceptance is key to them being allowed to return. The final option is a workplace situation where a live-in employment opportunity is offered. In the past, success was often judged based on whether a person was reintegrated back into their family. But if the family was involved in the trafficking process, this could result in the person being exploited again. So what is successful reintegration? First, a person achieves an amount of agency that is comparative to those who are not in a trafficking episode. In this case, agency is equal to control over life options. So what do we mean by this term agency in this context? Let's begin with an ordinary person who has not been trafficked. Note that this person has the ability to make choices and determine the general direction of his or her life. Now let's look at the difference one would see with a trafficked person. During a trafficking event, the person has very little control over his or her life. Successful reintegration occurs after a trafficking event, when the person has comparative control over his or her life choices. So what does this mean? Successful reintegration occurs when a person achieves an amount of agency, choice over life options that is comparative to those who are not in a trafficking episode. The person's needs or motivations to migrate do not force him or her to return to a situation where they are vulnerable to be re-trafficked. In other words, if the person has not sorted out the needs or motivations that got him into trouble in the first place, he will continue to be vulnerable to being re-trafficked or re-exploited. But having agency and not re-migrating out of desperation must also be complemented with something else, resilience and empowerment. These factors represent a positive and healthy aspect to the recovery process. Empowerment include the following. Decision-making power, access to information and resources, a range of options from which to make choices, understanding one's rights, affecting change in one's life and one's community, learning skills that one defines as important, trust in one's competency and capacity, increasing positive self-image and overcoming stigma. It is important to remember 
A person's trafficking experience does not end once he or she leaves a slave-like condition. This ensures that all of the needs of the trafficked person are taken into consideration as part of the protection process. If you have any questions, please forward them to Matt Friedman of the UNIAP or our website, www.notrafficking.org.